So good afternoon. Welcome everyone. While everyone's entering, please do turn off your microphones so that we avoid any, any feedback during this session and, and while the speakers are, are giving their talks. I see that people are still joining the room. Um, so this session is a session of contributed talks from attendees of, of the symposium from the last two weeks. Um, where we, we've thought that there were some particularly interesting uh, contributions that were, and we thought it would be nice to have some short talks to describe in a little bit more detail the work that some people are, are doing. And some people have already given a short poster presentation. You've had a chance to have a look online at the, the posters that were presented, but now we, we get a chance to see in a little bit more detail the work people are doing and, and to ask some questions uh, of, of our presenters today. So we have uh, six presenters today. Um, you'll see them at the top section of the, the grid if you're looking at the, the grid of everyone. Astrid Weston from the University of Manchester, Farka de Vries from the Laboratory of Solid State Physics at ETH Zurich, Enmin Chi from Columbia University, Carmen Rubio Verdu from Columbia University, Andres uh, Gadella from the Physics Department of the Universidad Federal de Minas Gerais, and Ipsita Das from here at, at ICFO. Each speaker will have 15 minutes, 10 minutes to, to give their talk, and then five minutes for questions. Uh, I invite people to send their questions through on the chat, uh, and at the end, we will uh, open the chat to general questions from the floor and, and I'll give you the floor and you'll be able to ask a question um, with a microphone or pass it through via the chat and I'll pass it on to, to the speaker. With that, we should start our, our session. Our first speaker is Astrid Weston. Astrid, I will invite you to share your screen uh, and then we'll, uh, we'll start your talk. So please do share your screen. Thank you, we can see the screen now. Okay. Uh, okay, so hello, uh, my name is Astrid Weston. I'm a third year PhD student from the University of Manchester. Uh, I'm supervised by Roman Gorbachev, and this talk is about our recent publication on atomic reconstruction in twisted bilayers of TMDs. Um, I only want to briefly introduce this area just quickly pointing out some very fantastic research that's already been done. First, there was the optical studies uh, highlighting Moiré intellet extons, uh, resident hybridization. But now, more recently, we're looking at the, the electronic properties where we're already seeing flat bands, correlated insulating states, and confine, electron confinement. Um, what we've already seen in graphene is that um, this regime um, of atomic reconstruction below critical angle already dramatically affects the electronic properties of that system. But in TMDs, uh, due to its um, asymmetric crystal structure, uh, in a bilayer, we're able to get multiple polytypes, which also means we then get multiple uh, superlattices. And we expect these to have different properties. Um, we'll show this uh, at the end of this talk um, with some conductive AFM where we show um, piezoelectric textures and layer polarization. So to first of all, we look at the actual atomic structure of uh, this 3R homobilayer. Um, what we directly see is um, below this critical angle of two degrees, we see um, two equally energetically favorable uh, triangular domains forming at the expense of this um, energetically unfavorable uh, configuration uh, that we denote XX. Um, we also calculated that we expect a modulation in the interlayer distance for this structure. We also saw the same reconstruction in heterobilayers, but you can see here that due to the different atomic weights of the metals, uh, we get quite different contrast. But if we move on to the conductive AFM, um, AFM is a simple measurement where we are applying a bias between a metallic tip and our sample. Here we use graphite to um, allow us uh, to have the ferment Fermi level near the conduction band minima um, and near the Q point. So 
um, in this instance, we're able to generate a, a tunneling current map across our surface. Um, one thing to note is um, we, we see this high contrast between the domains, but we're not seeing this in the height channels um, in contact mode. Although we are seeing contrast at the domain walls, which is um, what we expect from our interlayer distance calculations. Um, but in order to properly explain this con um, contrast variation, we can consider the um, electron wave function com composition in each of the two layers. If we do this, we see that um, electrons would prefer to be on the top layer in the system. But as we scan across um, the different domains and we're going from one to the other, we see this contrast flip and we are calling this uh, layer polarization. This is not a global phenomena. This is only happening locally between the different domains. And now we move on to this 2H homobiola, the other possible polytype. Um, again, we see lattice reconstruction between two different domains. Here we have a 2H, which is like a natural bilayer. TMD, and then we have this other configuration, MM, which is metal on metal. Um, the difference in this regime, um, these two uh, domains are not equal in energy, so they do not grow equally in size. So if we look at the transition over the different uh, twist angles, we see this, uh, what we expect a rigid Moiré super lattice to look like. And then we're seeing um, uh, these triangular domains form. And then eventually we see this 2H dominate and uh, we're eventually forming um, 2H, 2H boundaries that are in fact screw dislocations. So we transition into this, instead of a triangular domain, um, we have now a hexagonal domain. And again, we looked at the conductive AFM. Um, as we see in this left-hand side image, we do in fact get um, contrast between the different domains. But if we just consider the DFT calculated band structure, uh, we see very little difference between 2H and MM. The only difference here being that um, 2H actually, uh, the, the minimum sits below MM. So this doesn't directly um, tell us why MM we see uh, a brighter contrast. So at this point, I want to introduce the idea of piezoelectricity um, in monolayers of TMDs. Um, so although you would not expect um, a bilayer to have uh, this piezoelectric charge, um, we can think about this a bit differently. So say if we are stretching a bilayer, we're stretching both layers in the same direction. But in this new twisted system, um, we are twisting or we're straining in opposite directions in each layer. So uh, using this equation here, um, this piezoelectric tensor is what um, correlates the, the strain in each layer to um, the crystal structure. Uh, what we can see, sorry, my face is blocking the screen here. Um, what we can see is that, um, so if we first consider the 3R layer, uh, three R bilayer, the, uh, the strain tensors in both layers, um, they actually have opposite um, strain fields. So they effect effectively cancel each other out. Um, but if we now look at the 2H bilayer, um, what we calculated was that um, the induced strain fields in each layer are opposite due to the lattice orientation, which is different to 3R, is the opposite direction. So in fact, we double this uh, piezoelectric charge in each layer. So we effectively um, generate this uh, piezoelectric texture where we are getting areas of negative and positive charge. Um, we expect this uh, negative and pos positive charge to also um, induce um, pseudo magnetic fields in the same way. Um, and at low temperatures, we also expect to um, see uh, quantum dots or quantum like dots in this regime. So 
Next slide. Ah, I'm stuck. Just to summarize very briefly, uh, we've seen the, at the atomic scale, lattice reconstruction in both homo heterobilayers of 3R and 2H configuration. And we've demonstrated that uh, each of these different polytypes have very different electronic um, features, uh, which is layer polarization in 3R and strong piezoelectric textures in 2H. And just to acknowledge the three main groups, the theory was all done by the group of Vladimir Falco, stem imaging by Sarah Haig's group, and sample fabrication um, by the group of Rem Gorbachev. So I realize I have lots of extra time for questions. Thank you very much, Astrid. Indeed, we do have time for questions. We, we have a couple of questions coming through the, the group chat. Um, may I invite you to ask the question directly? So, Christian, you, you had a, a question. You should be able to turn on your microphone and ask it directly. Yes. Can you... Hello. Thank you for, uh, for the nice results. And uh, I, I was just wondering, um, I would like to know a, a bit more details about where is the contrast in conductive AFM maps coming from. So why does some domains show higher current than the others? And um, yeah, do you know what physics uh, stands behind the difference in current? So essentially the only difference, especially in a homobilayer compared to a heterobilayer, the only difference between these domains is the lack of inversion symmetry. So um, as we're locally scanning, over these domains. Um, so the, the uh, wave function composition, so say the top layer is um, more favorable for electrons that flips over. So now the bottom, um, that's more favorable for the electrons. And this is how we ex try to explain this um, contrast. Mm. Okay, yeah, but I still don't understand because you're doing this, this map. Yeah. Mm contact node, right? So this is just the current flowing through the barrier between the tungsten uh, or between the region and the, and the tip. So why is this barrier lower in certain domains than uh, in one domain than, than in the other? Um, this is just a very local um, phenomenon. So these uh, stakes are um, just like it's very much about the, the symmetry. There's um, not so much more to it. But if you would like more information on it, there's a, a full theory paper explaining all the theory for this. OK, yeah, that's, that's uh, This is, um, sorry, this paper here by um, Vlodger and Aldiv. This is a very good one. This is where I try and remind myself the theory behind it. Okay, great. I will make a photo. Yeah. Thank you, Christian. Andres, you had a question as well. You're, you're muted, Andres. You need to turn on your microphone. Okay. Hey, Astrid. Uh, thank you for your talk. Do you think is it possible to observe external localization in your system? Um, do you, um, exiton? Did yeah. You, I... I I'm not 100% sure. I know that there's already, um, okay, so there is a different system for each of the 3R and the 2H. So it depends which one you're looking at, but I think um, you're more likely to get localization in the 2H, if I'm correct. You'll get different effects in the, um, say this XM and MX stacking in the exciton, but it's not the same at all. But I think there was a talk earlier last week saying that um, you, you'll be able to get interlayer exotons in 2H homobilayers. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Does anyone else have a question from the floor? You, you may just uh, unmute yourself and ask a question. One last question. No more questions from the floor? In that case, may I uh, thank again Astrid for her presentation and invite our next speaker to, to come forward. So Astrid, if you could stop sharing your screen.
And our next speaker is Farka de Vries from the Laboratory of Solid State Physics, DTH Zurich. Farka, if you could share your screen. Yes, I'm Good. sharing. We can see your screen now. Yep. Fantastic. The floor is all yours for your talk. Okay, thank you, Rob. Uh, so my name is Volker de Vries. I'm uh, working in the group of uh, Thomas Ian and Klaus Enzin uh, in Zurich at the ETH. And first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for this uh, great meeting. I'm really enjoying all the, all the talks so far. Um, and for giving me the opportunity to talk about our latest work on uh, density wave states in twisted double bilayer graphene. Uh, the experiment is done, uh, so in Zurich, uh, all the theory is done by Yihang Tu in uh, LA McDonald's group. And of course we thank uh, the uh, growers of the boron nitride from Japan. Um, so as we probably all know, if we look at the, uh, uh, the Burian zone of uh, one of these twisted materials, one of these mini Burian zones is formed basically by connecting the, the corners of the Burian zones of, of the, the two, the two uh, graphene layers. And interestingly, if we're in a somewhat in intermediate angle, uh, we do uh, uh, still have some decoupling of the layers, uh, or to say it otherwise, the uh, states at the mini valleys kappa and kappa prime here, shown in the schematic on the left, are, are well, um, separated, are well layer separated. Um, and we're looking in this, in this regime for the reason that we then, if you have a top and a back gate, of course can uh, uh, view this a little bit as a double quantum well. So you have two, uh, two, two decks, uh, which you can uh, um, um, individually tune with these gates. Um, and the intermediate comes from that it's in between like the magic angle and very large angle. So at very large angles, as you can see here in the uh, yellow line, uh, the probability to find a mini valley kappa state in the top layer almost goes to 100%. Uh, and of course, we know at the, at the magic angle, these two or these four, layer, these four layers are uh, completely hybridized. Um, so if we now sit a little bit in between, we still have uh, uh, this independent layer tuning or independent layer control, but also already see some more of the correlations because the effective masses here uh, denoted by the blue line um, already uh, shoot up a little bit. So we're looking at this uh, device. The device is here on the top left. We do transport experiments. And the first thing I'd like to show you is uh, what we call so-called uh, Shupnikov the Haas phase diagram where here by using the top and bottom gate, we tune the total density on the x-axis and the displacement field on the y-axis. This plot is taking at 1.5 Tesla. Um, so we see, as we change the density, we see Shupnikov the Haas oscillations. And for example, uh, just to highlight a few regimes, here we see a regime where we see a bit of a checkerboard pattern. So it seems like we have two sets of Shupnikov the Haas oscillations. And here on top, we have only a single set. So using a, a simple capacitor model, but also looking at a uh, single particle band structure, uh, we can actually highlight all the, these regimes and uh, find out what kind of uh, bands are occupied. So let's first look at the simple case at zero displacement field. We have, as you can, uh, this line, we have both kappa and kappa prime valley, a mini valley occupied with either electrons or holes. There's a gap in between. But the interesting part happens when we now apply a displacement field. Since we have uh, bilayer graphene, the displacement field opens a gap at both uh, the kappa points or in both the layers. Uh, and it also uh, um, uh, displaces the two, these two uh, gaps uh, with respect to each other. And then you see that you get a reg region where you only have a single two deck or a single set of Shipikov the Haas oscillations, for example. And today I'd like to focus on this region where we have uh, actually two types of carriers. You can better see it in the plot down here, where we have electrons in one mini valley and holes in another mini valley or in another layer. Um, just from the single particle band structure, we don't expect much, uh, much special. But uh, when we take a closer look, so if we now take a cut here on top um, and it's a constant displacement field, you'll we'll see that uh, when we sweep the magnetic field, um, we see these two uh, lambda fans, one originating from uh, the onset of the whole uh, electron band and one from the whole band. 
And then at zero total density, so when the electron density and the hole density are equal, we see a resistance peak also in the, in the plot here on top. Um, and this resistance peak, uh, yeah, for us highlights that there is some, some insulating or uh, insulating state. And remember that from the single particle band structure, we don't expect any gap at all. So uh, this is why we uh, think this is a correlated insulator. Um, this uh, resistance peak has a, a thermal acti thermally activated behavior, as you can see here, where the peak goes uh, basically uh, flat at around 5 Kelvin. Um, and uh, when we include, uh, or actually when Yihang includes uh, uh, correlations in our band, uh, band structure calculations, uh, then we also see that this uh, band gap could open. So this is a hard free fog calculation uh, where the dashed lines are the single particle bands and uh, the dark blue and light blue bands are, uh, ele uh, are the Hartree Fock uh, bands. Uh, and note, please, that the dark blue and light blue, uh, they represent two, the two different valleys. So let's look a little bit more into detail what kind of uh, state this is. Um, this is a, what we see is a so-called yeah, density wave state, and it ha happens because of Fermi surface nesting. And in a simple one-dimensional case, uh, uh, this is uh, quite often present. So if you, if we can connect the two Fermi lines at minus KF and KF with a single uh, vector Q, which is quite easy in 1D, you can get such a density wave uh, state. In 2D, it's a little bit less uh, straightforward because you see if we connect, for example, at the Fermi surface, uh, this point and this point, uh, then the same vector will not connect the other two points. Now, in our... Uh, uh, twisted double value graphene, we can actually uh, get these nesting conditions. Here I, I uh, show the Fermi surfaces at both uh, valley uh, K prime and K, and then in those uh, you see the, uh, the two mini valleys. And what, um, what's immediately obvious is that uh, the, if you put these two on top of each other, if you look at the difference between these two, you see that the, the shape is a little bit different. And therefore, we don't expect to have much uh, Fermi surface nesting between the two mini valleys, but we do between the two valleys. So mind that now uh, the Q is actually much larger than KF. Now, what, with our gates and also with the magnetic fields, we can now study this uh, uh, hypothesis a bit further and also look uh, what happens. So now, if we increase the displacement field, we will just uh, increase the overlap of, uh, of the bands. And here on the right side, you see, or you see the, uh, the thermally activated gap as we increase displacement field. So this, the yellow region is the region where we have this uh, overlapping electron and hole bands. And you see that the gap increases with uh, increasing displacement field. Um, this also follows from the theory. So again, uh, we, these are Hartree Fock calculations, where here uh, we change the, um, the, the offset the voltage offset, basically the potential offset between the two bands. And then um, we see that the gap is indeed increasing. Uh, I just want to mention that uh, uh, we're now here not changing the Q factor, so the di distance between the two so much. And this is actually mostly an effective mass effect why the uh, gap increases. Uh, other than these thermal activation measurements, we can also look at, at source drain bias uh, measurements. So we bias our uh, device and we look at the conductance. And then we see that uh, uh, conductance suppression uh, uh, arises and it also increases as a function of displacement field. So displacement field down, you see that the, uh, this conductance suppression or gap is, is larger. So we can also take this as a qualitative uh, figure to, to look at this uh, correlated state. Um, then apart from the displacement field, we can of course also tune the density. And this is an interesting one since uh, this Fermi surf, uh, surface nesting all relies on the fact that the two Fermi surfaces really lie on top of each other, or you could say that they are only, uh, of course, if you connect, uh, if you correct by the by the Q factor. So if you now uh, go off this this uh, density um, equals zero, total density equals zero, so you change the relative densities in the electron and hole band, you see that the Fermi surfaces don't really line up nicely anymore. And in the measurement, we then see that this, uh, uh, this gap feature actually disappears. So here you see 
as we tune from, from zero uh, total density, for, so from equal electron and hole density to a density imbalance between the electrons and holes, you see that uh, um, um, the gap disappears. Also confirming uh, our hypothesis of the, uh, that this is a density wave uh, state. Um, then finally, I'd like to show you uh, some um, data on, in a uh, parallel magnetic field. Just let's first think about what we can expect. So in a parallel ma magnetic field, the Zeeman energy will split the electron and the hole bands. Um, so at, at zero uh, uh, density offset, we will actually find the best nesting conditions for, uh, for opposite spin. So for example, the one I highlight here on the left, the dark one and the light one will have total density zero. So we expect that our, our, our uh, density wave state has uh, um, opposite spin pairing. Um, if we now go to a, oh, oops. if we now go to a um, higher density, we can actually tune to a regime where here, for example, both the spin up bands have total equal density zero, and we would see a spin polarized uh, state. Now, oops. If we look in the data, we actually see this. So uh, here I plot the density as a, uh, as a function of. Uh, the resistance as a function of density for different fields. And you see if the uh, uh, field is increased to a Tesla, we see these two shoulders next to the resist central resistance peak emerging, which we think are, is because of this uh, spin polarized density wave. So uh, to sum up, I've shown you that we uh, see a density wave state in twisted double bilayer graphene that we can uh, tune with the displacement field. We can break the nesting with uh, changing the total density, and we can also make a spin polarized state out of it with a magnetic field. Thanks for your attention, and I'm happy to take any questions. Fantastic, thank you very much, Falke. Do we have any questions from the floor? Um, please, again, either put your question in the group chat and I'll, I'll invite you to talk, or, or indeed uh, just turn on your microphone and, and talk. And as long as we don't have too many at once, we should be able to manage. If anyone has a question, please, uh, please jump in. I have a quick question. <clears throat> so, uh, how sensitive uh, do you think this effect is on twist angle? Um, yeah, I think it's not not very sensitive in the sense that if you're around this, so we have a twist angle of two point three degree, mm -hmm. uh, then you're you're probably fine. But you need to be small enough to have these correlations and and large enough to be able to create this this band overlap with the gates. Um, we also now have another sample at, at 1.9 where we basically see the same, uh, the same physics. 1.9. And, and so, and sorry, and, and, uh, what is the, do you have a, um, okay. So do you have a more direct signature of correlations? Like, like, okay. So like in magic angle, of course you have the health field, health field insulators. Well, I would say that like, like as shown from the single particle band structure, we wouldn't expect anything special to be happening here, right? Mm -hmm. And we do see a, see a gap, so I don't know how. Okay, I like see. Like that's, mm -hmm. I would say, is quite a direct uh, evidence of that. A single particle doesn't describe it all, mm -hmm. but in the Hartree-Fock calculations, we do see the gap opening. Okay, mm -hmm. thanks. Thank you, Dima. Does anyone else have any questions from the floor? I see that Subhajit poses a question in the Zoom chat. Would you like to ask this question yourself, uh, Subhajit? Yeah, uh, first of all, thanks for the nice and clean SDS data. So uh, I just wanted to know why is there a uh, saturation in the correlated gap at uh, towards a higher electric field? Is that well understood? Uh, so you mean why here it's saturated? Yeah, um, I can quickly maybe show you these. So we actually, if we go to higher electric fields, uh, what we find is actually that the, the formation of this gap is not so much dependent on the overlap of the two, but more on the effective mass. So here you see also the gap calculated as a function of effective mass. And um, since the effective mass uh, doesn't, doesn't continuously go, grow larger as you, op as you apply more electric fields, you also don't expect the gap to continuously grow. Okay, thank you. 
Thank you, Surajit. Does anyone else have a, a question they'd like to ask? We've got time for one more question for Forko before you move on. No more questions? Okay then, well then, thank you very much, Falkert, for sharing your, your presentation with us. And we'll move on to the, to the next speaker. Our next speaker is Enmin Chi from Columbia University. Enmin, you're here with us. Um, may I ask you to share your screen? We can see it up online now. Fantastic, the floor is all yours. Please um, tell us about your work. I mean, I don't hear you. I think you're still muted. Ah, you're putting the microphone in. I see. Hey, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you well now. Hey, thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Amin Xu. I'm from Corey Dings Lab at Columbia University. Uh, today, uh, I want to talk about our work on twist by layer A stack tungsten diselenide. And our work is published recently, so you can check out for more details. Uh, so, so uh, correlated states in graphene flat band system has been studied intensely since the first discovered correlating insulator and superconducting states in twist by layer graphene by Pablo's group. Uh, the system has been improved a lot and many new results have come out this year as we have learned a lot from this meeting and I cannot put all the results on this slide. However, as the correlated state are sensitive to the twist angle, this system subject to the angle disorder as clearly shown in Zedo's talk. So another route to study the uh, correlated state is to look for them, look for them in the twist transition metal dichotonides, including the heater by layer TMDs, which I believe we can learn about that uh, from Professor Jinshan's talk tomorrow and uh, uh, we, can, uh, we can also do homo twist by layer, which I'm going to talk about. So we study uh, twist A stacking tungsten diselenide. Tungsten diselenide is featured with a parabolic band with large band gap. In transport, we only look at the valence band because the, this uh, tungsten diselenide is mostly P-type. Uh, while two layers stack together with uh, A stacking, um, the interlayer hopping is strong, so the two bands will hybridize with each other. Uh, with a small twist angle, um, the band is subjected to Mori potential and will open a gap at Mori Brisoin zone boundary. And by uh, 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 change the twist angle, we can uh, squeeze continuously the, uh, the, the first Mori band continuously. Uh, <clears throat> And uh, um, in this way, uh, we can get a, a, a continually change bandwidth. So contrary to graphene, the bandwidth vary continuously and we can expect the current energy to bandwidth ratio change continuously. So uh, the current energy is linear or square root of the twist angle when the interlayer distance is uh, considered uh, more wavelength or when near orbit size, respectively. Uh, while the bandwidth changes are more likely uh, quadratic. So there will be a region of angle, the bandwidth or kinetic energy is smaller than the current interaction energy where the correlated states can be formed. And because of the ratio of interaction energy to kinetic energy is continuous, the correlated state won't change drastically over a small angle range and the angle disorder is smaller. And the correlated coupling strengths can be tuned from weak to strong as we vary the angle. Furthermore, uh, this uh, system, uh, the band shape can be changed by vertical electric field, uh, which might affect the correlated state at weak coupling region. Uh, and this, in this system, is different from graphene that uh, it has only two holes per Mori unit cell. Initially, there are two bands from uh, two, uh, there are actually eight bands from two spin valley and layer, but the uh, uh, spin degeneracy is lifted because of the broken inversion symmetry and spin orbit coupling in this system. 
and the bands from different layers are uh, coupled together and form the lower and upper band because because of hybridization. So in one Mori cell, there are uh, which is enclosed by the blue lines here, uh, there are two holes. The electric uh, states are mainly localized at the A sites shown in the red circle, forming a triangular lattice. So this system is suitable to study Hubble model on triangular lattice. Uh, and also, uh, theory has predicted there might be a topological non-trivial band in this system and is tunable by displacement field. Uh, all of this give us the motivation to study uh, this uh, A stacking to spider contact serenite. So uh, we have measured several devices from 4 to 5.1 degree with Mori lens around uh, 3.7 to 4.7 nanometer, which is actually quite small compared to other flat band systems. We can uh, increase that further by reduce the twist angle, but at that time we only have uh, these few devices. However, a correlated state can still be observed. Um, here shows several curves on the right of four probe resistance versus charge density. So the, uh, the bottom line is uh, uh, typical uh, Bernal bilayer graphene, which is a natural form, uh, uh, Bernal bilayer times the serenite, which is a natural form type. Uh, uh, as we increase the hold up in the resistance just uh, goes down uh, monotonically. The curve is uh, featureless. Uh, on the other hand, for twist bilayers, we can see one peak or two peaks. We can ad identify the first peak with lower hole doping corresponds to one hole per Mori unit cell or halving of the band. Uh, it takes more doping to fill a Mori cell with larger angle, so we can see the half filling peak shifting with the angle. The second peak corresponds to two holes or four filling, and it's from the Mori gap. As as it is predicted from the uh, single particle band structure. However, the half filling peak uh, is unexpected from the single particle band structure, and it is uh, attributed to the correlated insulating state. Uh, we can see uh, from the temperature dependence that the uh, half filling, a uh, half filling, the resistance rise up suddenly at around 10 K and demonstrate the phase transition. The activation gap is around 2.4 milliEV, which is actually uh, much smaller than the theory predicted on site interaction energy, uh, which we, we don't have a clue why yet. Um, and uh, uh, th this uh, correlating insulating state turned out to be quite sensitive to the displacement field. As we vary the displacement field, the, sensitive, uh, res the resistance is picked at a, a certain displacement field and can be tuned to metallic state at lower and upper critical displacement field value as shown on the temperature dependence on the right. Sorry. Uh, this, this, uh, the system shows a clear metal insulator transition at two points. And uh, to understand the origin of this correlated state more, we measure the uh, arc S and arc Y, or the whole resistance under magnetic field. First, we notice the correlated state resistance decreases with field, which points to the anti-ferromagnetic nature of the state. And uh, we can also observe the land of fan coming from the uh, band edge and full filling, which enable us to accurately de determine the angle. Um, then we look at the whole resistance. We see several sign changes at low field. Um, the, to, uh, um, the sign changes uh, is due to the, uh, uh, the, the which is, can be expected uh, when the dispersion of the band change from hole-like to electron-like. Uh, the crossing point would correspond to the band hole singularity. From the DFT calculation, we expect the Van Hoek singularity or the peak of, the, uh, peak of density of state will move to higher filling as we increase the displacement field. And indeed, uh, we uh, measure the whole resistance at one Tesla uh, with different displacement field. We see the crossing moving away from the half filling to full filling as we increase the displacement field. 
as it moves away from half-filling the correlated insulating peak reduced to smaller value. Uh, we can see this effect in all of our device from 4 degree to 5.1 degree. The insulating state is the strongest when the Van Hoek singularity is at half-filling position and gets weaker as the Van Hoek singularity moves away. And we can map out the phases of correlated insulator and metal with different field and angle. The insulating region matches actually qualitatively well with the uh, measurement of density of state calculated from the DFT on the bottom right. The dependence of the strength of correlated insulator on the density of state indicate the system is at weak coupling region. As the Mori wavelength is small, uh, the interaction energy may be comparable to the kinetic energy. However, we also know that the insulating peak is always located at the half filling position rather than move uh, with the density of state peak or the Van Hoek singularity position, which indicates the origin is not solely due to Van Hoek singularity. And besides correlated insulating state uh, in the device with twist angle range from 4.8 to uh, 5.1, we observe two resistance packets fringe the correlated insulating peak, similar to twist ballet graphing. We measure a sharp resistance drop around uh, 5 Kelvin and a nonlinear IV curve in this region. However, this state is quite fragile and we can we cannot clearly see the Fraunhofer interference pattern as in twist by layer graphing. We cannot include uh, the uh, mechanism, other mechanism for this sharp drop of resistance yet. Finally, I want to appreciate my uh, uh, collaborators and funding agencies and uh, welcome any questions. Thank you. Fantastic, thank you very much, Edmin. So I'll invite questions from the floor. Again, either posting your question into the group chat or else directly asking your, your question uh, by unmuting your microphone and, and asking and then um, whatever you're, you're curious about. Okay. I have a question. Please, Oscar. Um, are there any indications of spin polarization in the half-filling insulator? Uh, yes. Uh, actually, uh, in, uh, in, in the... Uh, device with twist angle from 4 degree to 5.1 degree, we just see the anti-ferromatic feature. But uh, for uh, the 3 degree device, uh, we can see that the anti-ferromatic uh, feature decreases with magnetic field. And at higher field, a uh, uh, ferromatic feature shows up, uh, which uh, the resistance increase with magnetic field. So we think uh, at that critical, at some certain critical field, the uh, insulating state will become uh, spin polarized. Thank you. Thank you, Oscar. Does anyone else have a question they'd like to ask to Enmin? Um, yeah. Oh, no, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, okay, um, so um, I, w I was wondering, uh, you said that the effect of uh, electron correlation is uh, the highest um, when the van, van Hoos singularity matches the, the health filling of the band. Can, can you tell what, what this means? I, from my point of view, like the, the Van Hoof singularity basically um, sets the, the point where we have like our band. Or can you explain how you mean that? Uh, what do you mean sets our band? The, the Van Hoof singularity is basically our, our band structure, uh, like one band getting oh, really uh, flat. And the energetic position of the Van Hoof singularity basically yeah yeah, yeah yeah in in graphene case the the band is uh, very fat only ten millev but uh, in this uh, larger tree angle uh, uh, times selenide the band actually is not that fat and uh, it's finite in in width uh, it's around uh, 50, 50 millev also so uh, so the the uh, van singularity will happen at uh, some point of the band, but not not uh, the whole band. Uh, just like uh, this density of state shows here, the peak of the uh, density of state which correspond to van singularity will show up uh, at some point of the band. 
Okay, thank you very much. It was good explanation. Thanks. Thanks, Maximilian. Dima, did you have a question you wanted to ask as well? Just very quickly. Uh, so naively, I would imagine if you make the twist angle bigger and bigger, then the correlated insulators become stronger because the interlayer, the moray lattice uh, becomes closer. Yeah. Do, do you see that or? Uh, yeah, yeah, we, we do see that uh, uh, it, the, the, the insulating state extend more at higher, uh -huh. uh, higher angle. But uh, we didn't see any feature at a, a device with uh, 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 six degree. Uh, okay. And we don't have device in between, so we don't know what happened in between. What is the uh, spacing between moray sites, between the A sites and the five degrees? It's just a few uh, nanometers, right? Yeah, it's, uh, it's around uh, three to four nanometers, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, yeah. All right, thanks. Thank you, Dima. And thank you, Enmin, for your contribution. Uh, we, we've, we need to move on to the next speaker. Uh, our next speaker is Carmen Rubio Verdu from Columbia University. Um, Carmen, please share your screen now, and then we'll give you the floor for your the talk. I can see your screen coming on online. Okay. And now okay. we can see your, your slides. Please, the floor is yours. Okay, thanks. So I'm Carmen Rubio Verdu. I'm a postdoc in Aves Pasupati Lab at Columbia University. So thanks a lot for giving me the opportunity to show you our latest results in twisted double bilayer graphing. So by now we all know about the fascinating phenomena that emerges when we twist uh, two more layers of graphene at the magic angle. So flat bands emerge and electron correlations become important there and transfer experiments show the presence of correlated insulating states as well as a superconducting transition. So later on, local probes such as scan time microscopy showed uh, the presence of such flat bands on the moral lattice that you can see here, and also the opening of the correlated gap. And in addition of that, what they observe is uh, indications of broken rotational symmetry as you can see in these conductance maps. The thing is, uh, in the case of these samples, the moray wasn't very uniform and the ridges were not very big. So the system that I would like to talk about today is just a double bilayer graphene. In this case, each unit is a bilayer of Bernal graphene. So basically we take this AB graphene and then we put it on top of the other with a twist angle. And transfer measurements showed that around 1.3 degrees, uh, correlated insulating states also arise. And in this case, there is an extra tuning knob that is the displacement field. So basically this correlated state, we can switch it off on and off with the displacement field. And they also observe the opening of, of the gap with uh, the magnetic field, uh, which points towards some spin polarization for magnetic uh, order. So what I would like to discuss today in my talk is what is the role of the extra layers with respect to twisted bilayer graphene. What I mean with that is what is the stacking arrangement between the layers? Uh, also, where are these flat bands localized in this system in real space? And also, can we expect uh, some broken symmetries uh, also in twisted double bilayer graphene? And as, as you will see later, the answer is yes. So uh, all the results that I will show today are low temperature scan time microscopy and spectroscopy. We measure at 4.5 Kelvin. And this is the SDM geometry. We need to use open phase samples because we need to access them with the SDM tip. And we have a back gate voltage so we can dope, uh, we can move the Fermi level in the system. So first, uh, in the case of the twisted bilayer graphene, uh, the way we uh, know the stacking arrangement is by displacing one of the uh, layers, uh, the atomic lattice, in, in the six directions of the crystal. So basically what you end up with is with central AA sites and then two different domains that are AB and BA, so Bernal graphene, and these two domains are equivalent in this case. Now, in the case of twisted double ballet graphene, it becomes a little bit more messy because we have more layers, right? But we can think about it as if the two middle layers were just twisted ballet graphene. So we have AA sites, the center of the moire, and then we have um, 
AB and BA, right? And then we force the top and the bottom layer to be vernal with the one that is below and above. So in the result is that in the center of the moire, what we have is BAAC sites, so the old AA sites, and then we have domains of ABAB, vernal graphene, and then ABCA, and this is rhomohydrographene. So now these two domains that we have in the moire are not equivalent anymore, as in the case of twisted bilayer graphene. So here you can see a big uh, map of uh, a CM map of 200 by 200 nanometers a square of twisted double valet graphene at 1.05 degrees. So you can see that we have very big regions of very, quite uniform uh, moiré. And here I just show you a zoom in into a few unit cells so you can see better the moiré. So what is expected in the banner structure of twisted double valet graphene for these angles is to find two flat bands close to the Fermi level and then two other flat bands are higher energy that I will call the remote bands. And what we observe in the low temperature spectroscopy is precisely the presence of two flat bands here and then two remote bands at higher energies. And this dashed line indicates the Fermi level, okay? But the thing is, this DIDV that I show you is not obtained in the AA sites, the brightest spot. Um, it, it's in one of the two inequivalent domains. So if we look at the spectroscopy on each of the three inequivalent sites, what you can see is that the flat bands and the remote bands are present in all the three sites. It's just that the, the ratio of the spectral weight changes from one side to the other, right? So what we can anticipate already is that there's gonna be some interesting distribution of the local density of the states. And this is something that we can access with the STM. We can take conductance maps, right? So let's do it. Uh, now I will show you uh, conductance maps at the energies that I indicate with the gray line um, for the charge neutrality point, okay? So at high energies, you can see that uh, we basically observe the Nemore lattice, the bright AA sites. I indicated the, the, um, the unit cell to just guide the eye. <clears throat> and then when we set the energy to the remote bands, what we see is that the distribution completely changed and actually moved towards one of the two domains and it forms these nice triangular shapes. And at the energy of the flat bands, we see that again, changed side, and we have it on the other domain, just uh, showing this round or triangular uh, distribution. Okay, all this for the charge neutrality point. Now, what happens if we go to the half filling of the band? So you can see now the Fermi level is sitting at the flat band, and we do the same thing. Here are the maps for high energies, nothing changed. We see the AA sides. For the remote bands, we see these nice triangular shapes that change uh, the orientation with the energy, but nothing more. Now, when we look at the flat bands at the Fermi level, what we find is that the local density of the state's distribution changes completely. So you can see that we have these uh, stripes-like structure. And if you look at each of the other maps, in all of them, the symmetry of the system, which is C3, is, uh, remains present, right? It's only in this one that the symmetry has been reduced to C2. So basically, the system breaks rotational symmetry. And that broken rotational symmetry, uh, we observe it for these long range regions. So this is the 200 uh, nanometers map for a high energy. So basically we just see the water. And this is the Fourier transformation of this map. And you can see the three black peaks that correspond to the more wavelength. Now, when we look at the same region, but now at the energy of the flat band, uh, we observe these stripes that I was showing you before in a smaller region and two of the Bragg peaks uh, in the Fourier transformation of this map have vanished and only one survives that is the one that is responsible for these stripes. All this to say that the wave vector is the same so translational symmetry is preserved but rotational symmetry is broken for a given energy and doping condition. And this is indicative of a pneumatic ground state. So I hope you could see the great talk that Rafael Fernandez gave yesterday about how to introduce electronic pneumatic order in a MORE system. So in, in short, 
animatic or the parameter, what it's gonna do is gonna introduce some anisotropy in the hopings of the nearest neighbor of the moire here. And that what causes is the deformation of the Fermi surface, which of course is gonna cause a deformation of the moire, right? So if you're looking at the non-disordered moire here, these are the A sites, you can see that we have two, uh, three different bones, the red, the blue, and the green, depending on the orientation, right? So what this deformation of the Fermi surface is gonna do, um, is gonna deform the lattice, and we have three different ways of doing that that must be equivalent. That is basically making one of the three bones inequivalent. That can be the blue one, the green one, or the red one. And uh, the way the system does this is by redistributing the charge within the more unit cell. And what I would like to point out and insist a little bit on is that in our experimental results, what I just showed you is that we see this stripe order along, not in some random fashion, but along a preferential direction that is a crystalline direction of the system that is actually uh, the one of these uh, bonds that in the paper that discuss as bond order that are indicative of truly uh, electronic pneumatic order in more systems. And with that, I would like just to summarize. So we observe uh, flat bands in twisted double ballet graphene that for certain conditions of energy and doping um, show broken rotation symmetry. We didn't find any relation with the strain, uh, which is extremely small in, in our sample. And uh, we attribute this, we understand this in terms of electronic demand order, where bond order uh, arises as some charge redistribution within the unit cell that we observe as stripes uh, in the local density of the states. And just finally, I'd like to acknowledge all the people that uh, has been involved in this project, the funding agencies, and of course, all of you for your attention. Thank you, Carmen. May I invite questions from the floor? Again, either put your questions on the group chat or just open up your microphone and ask a question directly. I have a question. Um, Please ask it. questions. Uh, first, can you, do you know how much perpendicular displacement field there is in this, in this setup? So, um, as you know, in the STM geometry, uh, when we dope the system, maybe I can show the first uh, sketch here. Uh, we have only a back gate, we cannot have a top gate um, because we need to access the sample. So basically when we dope the system, we also introduce some displacement fields. So both of them are entangled and we cannot sweep them different, differently. Um, we estimate just with a parallel play capacitor, there is around 0 0.3, 0 0.4 volts per nanometer. But we have reason to believe that that field is screened by the graphene. So it's probably smaller in this case, in our measurements. Okay, thank you. And the second question I had, uh, are there any indications at all, maybe not as strong as for the pneumatic, but for the wave vector, which would be uh, new? Uh, and it was a wave vector which you did not have uh, at different fillings, uh, which would indicate that you also have a stripe order. Uh, so, so basically- You focus on the brightest one. Uh, is there anything not so bright at different wave vectors that did not exist before? No, yeah. no, we do not serve any new uh, wavelengths. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Oscar. Does anyone else have a question for Kamen? Um, yeah, I, I would have a question. So, uh, first of all, um, the the uh, voltage. This basically is. Um, for the STM images, this basically resembles the, the doping concentration. Is that right? Or are you, so you're showing that the voltage for the different images, like minus 58 millivolts, minus six? Yeah. So, no, there are two voltages, right? There is a back gate voltage that is the one that is changing from this row to this row. So, from turn neutrality to um, half filling. And then there is the bias voltage that is just sweeping through this uh, range. Uh, so in transport, you will have only the, the information at zero bias, right? But we can go uh, above and below the, the Fermi level in the SCM. Okay, and um, the, the like one dimensional stripes you see there, um, 
they are they they are basically only an electronic response you don't see you don't think there is anything um with the letters involved or something uh no yeah we believe it's just electronic order because we see them only for some doping conditions and for the energy of the flat band do, do they disappear at higher temperatures or we we have measurements only at 4.5 kelvin we didn't um, measure at higher temperatures but okay. that would be interesting yeah thanks thanks maximilian any other questions i saw one person was uh, unmuting themselves, I think, at the same time as Maximilian. One last chance. Any other questions from the floor? Yeah, I have one question. Uh, Adrian, please. please. Yes, small question. Um, do you think if uh, you get this kind of uh, nematic order uh, with uh, two times uh, bilayer system, a twisted bilayer system can uh, can it be uh, can it be a study like 1d chain or something like this uh, because you broke the the rotational symmetry can you consider it as a 1d system uh, you mean like in a one dimensional interest way for or something or a system like that yeah exactly like you have a 2d system and because of uh, you twisting it and you uh, you create nem nematic order can it uh, be a transition from 2D to uh, a 1D behavior or something like this? 1D uh, transport? Uh, I'm not sure one can think of it in that way. I'm not sure. Oh, okay. Just, okay. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Adrian, and thank you to everyone for asking questions. And in particular, thank you very much to Carmen for your presentation, much appreciated. We should move on to the next talk, the penultimate talk. We've got two more to come. Um, the, the next speaker uh, is Andres Cadena from the Universidad de Federal de Minas Gerais. Um, please, if you could share your screen, Andres. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, I can see your screen. Okay, and today, so just before you start, may I just ask everyone, there's a couple of people who've entered in the last several minutes, if I could just ask everyone to mute your microphones uh, to avoid any interference. Andres, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Rob. So my name is Andres Gadelha, and I'm a postdoc at UFMG in Brazil, and I work in collaboration with Professor Ado Jorio, and this is my talk, The Lattice Dynamics Localization Probed by Nanorama Spectroscopy. This theory paper shows that below a critical angle of one degree, the twisted bilayer graphene suffers a reconstruction process. And here I show an image of a non-reconstructed twisted bilayer and of a reconstructed. The so-called reconstructed twisted bilayer graphene that I call here RTBG is mainly composed by alternating AB BA stacking domains, which are separated by SP solitons and it has topological AA points. This particular arrangement confers the system local properties that will be the end of my talk. And I start by describing, by showing you the first imaging of more patterns using visible light. Each of the pixels in the image has spectral information, which in turn carries a lot of physics. In the first case, we can only see these, these patterns with visible light due to localization physics that I will discuss. But before that, I'd like to show you the methods that we use. And we use a tip enhanced Raman spectroscopy setup. Uh, we use a laser from the below that illuminates the TBG and a special tip that we call PTTP. This special tip is a monopole nano antenna which apex can be adjusted to the laser energy, giving ultra large near field amplifications. To elucidate, to illustrate that point, I plot the Raman spectra of a monolayer graphene where we can see the G and the 2D bands. And in blue, I plot the standard micro Raman signal. When we land the tip, we have a very large enhancement of all the peaks of about 100 uh, of order. So we can study local nano Raman of the graphene with a very large intensity. The other procedure that we did was a versatile tear and stack method that allows obtaining 
control clean twisted bilayers without a capping border nitride flake. So this is quite appealing for near field applications. And now I discuss the phonons in the RTBG sample through the G band and the show uh, the phonon dispersion evaluated by our collaborators. And the G band is related to phonons, uh, optical phonons close to the gamma point. In red, I plot the phonons for the Bernal bilayer and in blue for an RTBG with an angle of 0 0.9 degrees. And you can check that for the RTBG, the phonons ramificate in two branches. And I'll try to investigate the theory plot in experiment. First, I show a nanospectrum of an RTBG with an angle of 0 0.09 degrees for the AA, SP, and the AB regions. And we see the G band in the middle and some new satellite peaks. For the AB, we observe a single G peak, but for the AA, we observe a lower frequency peak that we call GR minus. And for the SP, we observe a higher frequency peak that we call GR plus. We can assign these two satellite peaks to the two theory branches. And just for comparison, we plot the frequency difference that for the theory is about 45 centimeters to minus one. And for the experiment is about 90 centimeters to minus one. There is a difference here that we ascribe to the different angles that we work in theory and on experiment. And now we look how these phonons are in space. And first we, we look at the theory and we use a state-of-the-art calculation, a nearly free phonon model, where we can plot the partial density of states for the GR minus peak over the space. And we can observe a very strong spatial modulation of this range. And we observe higher intensities at the AA regions and at the center of the AB zone. So this theory shows that we observe local phones. And we can observe this experimentally. Yes, we can. And the best technique is our state-of-the-art tip enhanced Raman spectroscopy. And here I show experimental data where we plot the spectral contribution of the GR minus peak, and we observe higher intensities at the AA zones, just like the theory. We can do the same procedure for the GR plus peak, but here we observe both in theory and the experiment that it, the GR plus has its larger contribution at the solitons, at the SP stack. Okay, so our results show that we have a phonos partial modulation in our RTBG, indicating phonon localization. But can we study the electrons in our nanorama setup? Yes, we can, through the 2D band, which is a double resonance process, profoundly affected by the electronic structure. And here I show a nanorama spectra of the AB zone and it's very similar to the Bernal stack bilayer. And by plotting the spectral contribution of this peak over space, we observe higher intensities at the A, B, and B, A zones. And we can roughly see the more edge structures here, but we can also observe the first pure spectral contribution of uh, SP soliton. This is the blue curve, which is quite different than the AB spectrum. And we observe similar uh, spectrum for the AA zone. And when we plot the spectral contribution over space, we observe high intensities at the AA and the SP zones. And we have this very beautiful image of the uh, Moray patterns. We still don't know yet the physics behind this particular shape and we are running some calculations. But this information tells us that the 2D band varies through space. So we observe electron localization through the nano Raman. But it, it is also interesting to investigate the electron phonotalpin. And we can do that by means of the G full width, a heavy maximum as a function of the space. And we observe a very clear modulation of this parameter. We observe higher intensities at the G and the, at the AA and SP zones. And to understand this measurement, 
we should take a look at the electronic structure close to the frame level, where G phonons can be observed. And when they are observed, its lifetime decrease, which in turn increase the phonon line width and so the electron phonon coupling. So the higher the phonon absorption, the higher is the electron phonon coupling. And to have a better understanding of this problem, we asked our collaborators to plot the local electronic density of states as a function of the energy for the three regions. And look that close to the G phonon energy, we have a very high peak at the AA zone and a smaller peak at the SP, while no peak at the AB uh, triangles. This theory tells us that we expect to observe a very strong phonon, G phonon absorption at the AA and the SP sites, which broadens the G peak accordingly, just like the experiments that we observed. And as we have, have a spatial modulation of the electron phonon coupling, we observe the electron phonon coupling localization through the nanorama. We are also interested in a Roman fingerprint for the reconstruction process, which can be done in terms of the G width as a function of the twist angle in blue, and we plot in red the burnout and single layer for reference. We can observe a clear fingerprint for reconstruction where a maximum of the G width is at the critical angle. It's also interesting to note that the maximum value is close to the magic angle, indicating a very strong electron phonon coupling at the magic angle. This could help elucidating the superconductivity effect. Well, I'm at the end of my talk, and just for conclusion, the RTBG is an exciting platform for local phenomena, and that the nanorama is quite suitable to study uh, these effects. For more details, you can check our preprint paper, and any doubt or collaboration, you can email us. So I'd like to thank a lot the, the organizers for the opportunity. I'd like to thank our collaborators for the help and you for watching it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andres. So again, I'd like to invite questions from the floor for Andres. Again, there's a couple of people who've just joined. So uh, please either send your question through to the group chat or uh, directly ask your question by unmuting your microphone and, and speaking up. Does anyone have a question from Andres? I'll give it just a minute to see if there's any other questions from the floor. You had one comment in the group chat, but it's a congratulation rather than a question, so. Oh, oh, thank you. Question to, <laughs> to say it Come on, everybody. Please ask some questions. <laughs> Any questions? I, I hear someone unmuted there. Adriana? No, okay. So we, we shall move on. Andres, thank you very much for your, your contribution. Much appreciated. I ask you to stop sharing your screen and we'll move on to the very last question, uh, last talk of, of the session. Okay, thank you. Our last, thank you very much. Our last speaker is Ipsita Das. She works here at ICFO uh, and she's going to tell us about untying the insulating and superconducting orders in magic angle graphene. Ipsita, I ask you to share your screen. And just before Ipsita, yeah, I can see your screen. Okay. And just before Ipsita starts, um, may I ask everyone, please don't run away right at the end of Ipsita's talk. I'm going to ask everyone if they'd uh, be willing to participate in a group screenshot uh, at the end of the, of the session. So don't, don't leave quickly at the end of Ipsita's talk. Contribute here to the, the questions and then stick around for a, a group screenshot. Ipsita, the floor is all yours. Please tell us about your work. Thanks, Rob. Since we're almost towards the end of the conference and there has been many talk about the formation of flat band in graphene. I would not go into the details of that, but I would start with the phase space in crystal graphene. So as we know, if we have two layer of uh, graphene rotated by a magic angle close to one degree, then a flat band uh, forms uh, at, at very low energy level which is separated by the higher or higher order dispersive bands. 
and uh, this is the this is how the phase space uh, look like in this bilabrapin. So uh, this is a this is a cartoon picture of the phase space with temperature and carrier density. So at zero carrier density, which is the charge neutrality point, uh, you have a highly resistive state. Sometimes uh, this is if you keep on filling the band, the flat band with either electrons or holes, you have uh, several correlated insulating states at uh, integer filling of the band. And along with that, you also have superconducting state if you uh, dope the, the insulating state. In terms of correlated insulating states along with with a superconductor raises an immediate question about the interplay of their order. So to answer that question, simple mod insulated picture. So here is the Hubbard model for one electron per side in a mod insulator. So the Hamiltonian has uh, mainly two terms. One is the uh, hopping energy, which is uh, given by small p here. And the other one is the on-site Coulomb interaction term given by U. So this, if we consider the block potential, then the, there is a on-site Coulomb interaction term between uh, two electrons. And on, on top of that, there is a huge energy cost if you if you want to pop one electron from uh, one one side to another. So basically, in a mod insulated picture, this ratio of u by p is much higher, so you have uh, insulating state. But in twisted bilayer graphene, the, the picture is not exactly similar because you also have insulating states uh, for different integer filling of the band. Uh, but if we, if we consider other systems, uh, then we can see that there are uh, more insulating uh, states in uh, different systems, for example, to cuprates or uh, different lattice, lattice uh, systems. But the main uh, important parameter here is the U, we can, we can switch uh, this insulating space. So if we consider cuprates, uh, the lattice field is of the order of few and strong. And uh, if we consider different cold atoms, see systems, the lattice scale is much higher of the order of a few microns. So in both the systems, uh, it's not very easy to tune this parameter because of uh, because of the lattice scale uh, limitation. Whereas a uh, layer graphene falls in the middle of these two systems where the lattice scale is of the order of 10 to 15 nanometers. So actually we can uh, uh, tune this U by D ratio in this bilayer graphene uh, very easily. So uh, we have two different unique norms in our system. One is the twist angle. So here is a two graphene layer twisted by an angle theta, and we can see that there are several uh, regions of uh, A, 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 B, and B, A. And uh, done recently by in, in major physics review paper, uh, which is the density of states as a function of uh, different twist angles. As we change the twist angle theta, the Mori wavelength changed. So we can consider that the hopping energy between different uh, lattice uh, sites uh, gets changed. So by changing the twist angle, we can change the parameter P. And another knob is the screening. So uh, in in our typical twisted bilayer graphene devices, we sandwich our twisted bilayer with two uh, hexagonal boron nitride layer, which can add graphite layer, which, uh, which, which, is, which is used for uh, tuning the area density in our system. Basically, this is a metal layer, which can screen the electronic interaction in this bilayer graphene. And this uh, dielectric environment of twisted bilayer graphene can be tuned by the thickness of this bottom HBN. So 
by changing the thickness of bottom HPN, we can change the on-site Coulomb interaction energy, which is Q. So we see that in twisted bilayer, we have two different knobs. One is twist angle and screening, by which we can we can actually tune the parameter uh, U by T ratio. Here is a, a calculation uh, from our group, and uh, this is for uh, twisted bilayer graphene uh, interaction energy for uh, for calculated in different uh, dielectric thickness uh, value. So we can see that for for very where W is basically the thickness of bottom HPN, and we can see that for smaller uh, dielectric constant thickness uh, we have. Uh, full on screening at a very lower value of bottom HPN thickness. And uh, this value kind of saturates at a, at a value of 24 milli electron volt. Uh, above that, this is basically unscreened region. So, so this dotted line uh, is the unscreened region. And this is the schematics of our screening calculation. So here is the uh, twisted bilayer graphene nitride uh, from the metallic graphite layer. And when the thickness of HBN is much smaller than the mole wavelength lambda, then we can consider there is a image charge formation at metallic graphite layer. And this image charge can screen the electronic interaction in twisted bilayer graphene. Whereas, if we consider uh, HPN thickness, which is much higher than the Moire wavelength, then there is not much uh, image charge formation at the uh, metallic graphite layer. Hence, the interaction in twisted bilayer is much stronger. So, with that, I would talk about the experimental result from our group. So, this is the phase space for, of three different devices with three different twist angle and uh, hexagonal boron nitride uh, thickness. So this, this D1 has the thinnest HBN. For that, we have seen that uh, there is the high resistive state at charge neutrality. Okay, the color plot indicates, uh, so the blue color indicates very small or maybe zero resistive resistance, and the dark red color indicates very high resistance. So at charge neutrality, uh, there is a high resistive state. And if you uh, feel the band, then in this device, there is no uh, insulating, correlated insulating states. Rather, there are two broad superconducting domes here. On the other hand, if we consider the device where the HPN thickness is much higher, we see that the, from charge neutrality, there are uh, several correlated insulating states at different integer filling of the band along with different superconducting states. And uh, the D2 has intermediate HBN thickness for which both the picture kind of overlap. So uh, you have in electron side, you have some uh, correlated insulating states. On the other hand, in the whole band, you, you don't have any insulating states. Rather, the superconducting state is uh, still present. So from this, uh, Observation: We can conclude. Uh, we can maybe conclude that uh, the correlated insulating state and the superconducting state are from uh, different origin, and uh, they they are competing with each other. On top of that, also we have uh, seen some charge turn insulating behavior in the device D1, where uh, in which device at zero magnetic field we did not see any uh, insulating state. But if we apply a very small magnetic field of the order of 0.4 Tesla, we have seen that uh, there is a turn insulating state emerging at half filling of the band. With that, I would uh, like to thank uh, Dima and Peter and Shavo, who mainly led this uh, project in this office to buy their graphene in our uh, group. And uh, the screening calculation was done by Professor Leonid Lepitov from MIT, and thank you all for your attention. Thank you very much, Ipsita.
Does anyone have a question for Absita? Again, uh, either through the group chat or directly open your microphone and ask a question from the floor. May I invite questions from anybody? Uh, hi, uh, I, have, I have a question about the, uh, the screening. Um, you, you also notice that the angle is different, right? The three sample. There might be two effects. One is uh, because of the angle and uh, like it, it can be from both the angle and the screen. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So how to like decouple those two uh, factors? Do you have any uh, insight on that? So uh, probably if we uh, consider the band width of a uh, different wrist angle, the, uh, it can be clear whether which which effect is uh, more dominant 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 here. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, but we, we should highlight you. Thank you, Jiri. Does anyone else have a, another last question for Ipsita? Fran, uh, Paco Guinea, Francesco, you have a question? Please. Yeah, the, the, can you hear me? Yes. The insulating phase you mentioned at half filling, can you quantify how large the gap is or what is the critical temperature? Yeah, uh, so for example, for this device, we it was uh, quite large of the order of probably 0 0.3 electron volt or so. And uh, the, the temperature the temperature was around probably 5 Kelvin per it uh, when we first uh, observed the polar red states. Okay. Any further questions? One last opportunity for a question from the floor. Well, then, if there are no further questions, if see them, I ask if you could stop sharing your screen. Uh, and I thank you again for your, your contribution today. Sure. And uh, before everyone disappears, uh, I've had a request to ask if we could have one screenshot with everybody sure. who is willing to turn their video on. Excellent. and brush their hair and take a quick cup of coffee, et cetera, uh, to join us. Um, so of course, uh, feel free to join only if you, if you wish, but it would be fantastic to have a full screenshot of as many of us as are willing to, to share their screen as possible before we wrap up this session. So let's just give it uh, one minute to allow everyone to turn on their, their videos. And while I'm doing that, let me please take the, the opportunity to thank all of our speakers today. Uh, so we had talks from Astrid, Farkat, Enmin, Carmen, Andres, and Ipsita. Thank you very much for your contributions and for taking the time to tell us about your work. People can follow up on those looking at the posters on the symposium website. And we will have again the online town open after this closes, if anyone would like to join there and, and speak to either the speakers today or, or some of the speakers during the week. It looks like we've got a very full set of uh, videos. So, um, Merci, are you ready for a screenshot? Yes, I'm ready. Uh, we have three full screens of uh, little use, so I'm just going to do a very quick screenshot. Uh, just smile and this is it. Okay, this is one. This is the second. That would be so much better in person in Barcelona, right? <laughs> and this is the last one. And then okay. when you finish that, perhaps we could get one Merce with everybody waving. Could everyone say hi or goodbye? Mm -hmm. oh. Okay, I have it. Great. Hi, this is good. Fantastic, okay. thank you Merce. Thank you to everybody for your contributions. Thank you to all of the speakers. Thank you to all of you for, for joining. It was a long session today, and I'm glad that you all stayed till the end. And I look forward to seeing you at tomorrow's, uh, tomorrow's talks.
we have two days left of the, the school. Uh, so three more talks and then a, a final roundtable discussion. The talks tomorrow are from Tobias Stauber um, from the SIC in, in Madrid and Ji Shan from Cornell University. So please join us 3 p.m. Barcelona time tomorrow afternoon, Thursday the 16th of July for our uh, penultimate day of the symposium. Fantastic to see you all. See you tomorrow. Thank you very Thank much. You. See you tomorrow I'm going to have a meeting in and that will be for today. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.